war studies from King's College, London, and served as a Royal Air Force chaplain. And speaking third on EU perspective is again Dr. Greg Reichberg, you've met, a research professor at the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. He co-leads, you and you're co-leading this project with uh, Henrik, Warring with Machines, Military Applications of Artificial Intelligence and the Relevance of Virtue Ethics, a four-year project funded by the Research Council, Council of Norway. His publications are many and include Thomas Aquinas on War and Peace and the edited volume Robotics, AI and Humanity, Science, Ethics, and Policy. In 2021, he was appointed consultor to the Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, where he focuses on disarmament, the ethical implications of new military technologies, and broader issues of war and peace. And then discussing Chinese perspectives on AI military ethics is uh, Mark Metcalf, retired Surface Warfare Officer and Navy Cryptologist and a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Upon leaving active duty, he served as a project manager, systems engineer, and technical analyst and translator supporting a range of government sponsors. Since 2014, he has taught courses at the University of Virginia in Chinese literature and at UVA's McIntyre School of Commerce. His primary research interests include the translation and analysis of PLA texts that discuss contemporary applications of Chinese historical strategic thought, as well as Chinese perspectives regarding the role of military ethics in modern warfare. So thank you all for joining us, two virtually, and Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon here uh, in, in Europe. Uh, my name is Anna Nadibaidze. I'm a PhD fellow in the Center for War Studies at the University of Southern Denmark and a researcher for the Otto Norms Project, uh, which focuses on autonomous weapons and international norms on the use of force. And much of my doctoral research uh, explores the Russian perspectives uh, of uh, military uh, on military AI. And uh, this is the topic of my presentation today. Uh, part of it is based on this report that was mentioned that I wrote uh, and it was published um, in January, so before before the the war in Ukraine. Um, and uh, actually, um, I wanted to start um, a little bit with uh, with the developments that have been ongoing in the recent years, but uh, before before the invasion of Ukraine. So for for the Russian leadership, uh, AI is really perceived as a key technology for the 21st century. Uh, it's perceived, uh, if you look at the Russian uh, official discourse, as um, a way, uh, a necessary, a necessity uh, in terms of modernizing Russian armed forces, especially the equipment uh, from Soviet times. Uh, also necessary to gain strategic advantage on the battlefield and to more broadly to show that Russia is willing to, and able to compete in the, in the so-called uh, global AI race uh, and uh, ready to challenge the U.S. leadership especially and uh, Chinese uh, leadership to, to, to a certain extent as well. And uh, other factors, uh, other motivations named in the Russian literature um, especially um, in terms of uh, AI and algorithms uh, include um, the perception that these uh, using algorithms can reduce uh, the cognitive burden on soldiers and mitigate their errors and also a motivation for uh, more for um, robotic uh, uh, systems and uh, unmanned and uh, uncrewed systems um, include um, the um, factors like geography, so uh, patrolling the Russia's long border, and especially in harsh conditions such as uh, the Arctic, and addressing um, issues with uh, personnel costs and uh, decreasing defense budget. And uh, there are a number of factors that um, kind of uh, incentivize the Russian leadership to uh, make their 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 goals in terms of military AI more concrete. Uh, and this includes, of course, the developments in the civilian, um, civilian sphere, so um, advances in, in AI in an industry, just more broadly, 
and uh, also developments abroad, so especially in the US um, and the US interests in that area. Uh, also, Russia's uh, opportunity to test some, uh, some robotic systems and um, remotely controlled weapons, especially in Syria. And uh, some lessons learned from the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict in 2020, when there was uh, use of, of drones and loitering munitions, and that was perceived as a kind of a um, justification or perhaps reinforced the, the, the Russian perception that this is these are technologies that are worth investing in. So I'm not going to go in detail through the goals and strategies just to highlight maybe this uh, comprehensive target program from 2015 set an objective of 30 around 30 percent of combat power being um, remote art either partially or fully remotely controlled also russia has a national strategy for ai um, from 2019 and this this is not specifically for military ai but uh, it kind of sets the objective of russia becoming one of the ai leaders uh, by 2030 and uh, last year in 2021 there was uh, th there were quite a few developments in the sphere of military ai so for example uh, russian defense minister sergey shaibu uh, announced that the uh, the previously set target of 70 percent of, of conventional forces being modernized has been achieved uh, now, modernized, of course, means different things, but um, the integration of AI and robotics are, are two key directions of this modernization. Uh, he also announced the production of combat robots, which um, it's not entirely clear what exactly he was referring to, but uh, we can assume that these are robotic systems with autonomous features. Uh, now, how to how to realize all of these ambitions and these goals? Um, this uh, is mainly done uh, through uh, state affiliated institutes and organizations. So it's a very much a top down approach in Russia, where the state is is leading on AI development. And so, for example, here we have the. Uh, Era Technopolis, um, this is kind of a techno park in, in southern Russia, um, which um, yeah, which uh, does research and development in, in various um, uh, military technologies, including AI and robotics. Uh, the Advanced Research Foundation, this, um, this was meant um, as, a, as a competitor or an equivalent to the US DARPA. Uh, there are various departments in the and the Ministry of Defense, uh, which um, are quite secretive, and uh, state corporations are uh, very important. So um, the most important one in the defense sector being Rostec, uh, and uh, and then it has multiple subsidiaries and manufacturers uh, such as uh, Kalashnikov included in it. Uh, areas of interest, uh, I'm not going to go into detail because they're actually quite similar to, to the US uh, area of, uh, areas of interest of integrating AI and other actors. Um, what I would also like to, to mention um, in terms of similarities is uh, the debates on the role of human control uh, in the sense that uh, uh, perhaps there is an impression that uh, Russian leadership um, looks uh, and seeks to develop completely fully autonomous weapons or or systems of command and control, uh, but there are actually similar debates as in the U.S. or elsewhere about um, about the human role. So, uh, if we look at the discourse of the of the Russian leadership, there isn't full trust towards AI. So there is a recognition that. AI doesn't have the emotions and the, and the human judgment necessary to make uh, to make these important decisions on the use of force and especially in the nuclear domain. Uh, and so I, I cannot say 100 percent whether these uh, these debates are taking place because of ethical or moral concerns. It could also be you know security concerns and the uncertainty uh, and um, 
vulnerability of, of uh, to, to hacking, for instance, and things like algorithmic bias. So it could be a, a, a mix of all of these concerns, uh, ethical, moral, and security. But um, the point is that uh, these debates are taking place in, uh, in the Russian uh, official discourse and in the literature, military literature as well. So, yes, so um, as we've seen, Russian armed forces uh, have tested and um, have been developing uh, many different systems with autonomous features and integrating, trying to integrate AI. So um, the expectation uh, of many uh, was that in case of a military conflict, uh, these systems uh, or some of these systems, especially those that uh, have been tested in Syria would play uh, an important role and that Russia uh, would rely on uh, especially drones, uh, uh, weapon munitions, and uh, perhaps robotic tanks or ground, uh, uncrewed ground vehicles as well. So uh, what we see, what we currently see on the ground in Ukraine, at least from what is available in terms of open sources, um, is that uh, drones are, are mostly used for reconnaissance and surveillance. So um, like the Orlan uh, here pictured, uh, some drones are also used for combat, but this is according to the Russian Ministry of Defense. So um, I cannot confirm this. Um, we can also um, presume that there is, there, there are, uh, invisible uses of AI, so in terms of uh, analyzing information on the battleground, uh, uh, analyzing uh, social media uh, images and satellite imagery, and also AI plays a role in the so-called information war, so um, it kind of fuels into the Russian government and propaganda's narrative that they are using uh, high precision weaponry and that um, this is used uh, to strike uh, only military targets and not civilian targets. So, of course, these are for domestic consumption purposes. We know that this is not true, but it's important still to recognize that AI kind of is part of this whole narrative of uh, justifying this, this war. And um, recently, we also seen reports of the use of weapon munitions, so the coup, um uh, coop uh, drone. Uh, it's not an autonomous uh, system, but it, it has also um, been uh, kind of branded by the manufacturer, which is Kalashnikov, um, as a high precision weapon. And um, as you can see, this kind of um, gives the, the picture that uh, perhaps the, the expectations about an AI on the battlefield have not been fulfilled um, and um, yeah the the reality currently doesn't match uh, what we expected and just quickly on on the future perspective so um, all the ambitions that are outlined at the beginning uh, and the plans um, uh, are quite highly unlikely to be to become reality due to what is going on right now with uh, an exodus of tech and IT specialists, uh, tens of thousands of tech workers leaving Russia, uh, economic sanctions, uh, especially um, sanctions on uh, for, uh, hardware uh, for which, on which Russia is relying, so semiconductors and, and microchips, uh, things like that. and. Uh, suspension of research collaborations and academic uh, kind of um, cooperation with the rest of the world. So all of these factors make it uh, unlikely for, for uh, the Russian ambition to become one of the AI leaders um, to be fulfilled in the, in, the, in the near future. So yes, I think my time is up. I just wanted to invite you to, to look at the at our project, the Autonomous Project. We also have um, China, Japan, and the US as case studies. And um, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the, to the other presentations. Thanks very much, Anna. And next up is uh, Dr. Peter Lee from University of Portsmouth on the UK's programs. 
Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the invitation. And I'm assuming that unless I'm interrupted, uh, I can be heard. So uh, I'll just I'll just proceed right away. It, it's partly um, slightly disorientating giving this remote presentation today on, on two grounds. Firstly, sitting in the city of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom, which is probably the most naval significant um, city in the in the UK with a great long history. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the challenges for UK defence and, and AI ethics of that. But within half a mile of where I'm sitting um, are the, the UK's two new aircraft carriers and a 500 year old Mary Rose ship, which was which was state of the art at the time, and the 250 year old HMS, HMS Victory. So we see just in, in my little microcosm here uh, what state of the art has looked like and how it has changed over 500 years. And that's where we're that's where we're debating in terms of ethics uh, just now. It's what what does ethics mean in, in the advancement of AI. So I won't read through all of this, but I'll share my slides with uh, with Ed, Ed Barrett afterwards for distribution if anyone's interested. I've put in quite a few of my own papers and, and live links to work where I've been wrestling with uh, ethics and AI or, or, or intelligent systems or machine learning and autonomy for quite a number of years. And Recently, my, one of my most recent projects was looking at the legal, ethical and moral perspectives on advanced technology and weapon system use um, in current and future conflicts for, for the Ministry of Defence. And the last thing I'd say by, by personal introduction is that I also sit on the, the UK's Ministry of Defence Artificial Intelligence and Autonomy, Autonomy Ethics Advisory Panel. What I was hoping to tell you about today was the, was the newly published um, UK AI ethics, defence AI ethics principles, um, which should have been published many months ago and should have been published last month and then this week and still aren't published. So I don't really think it's for me to, to, um, to publish them on behalf of the Ministry of Defence today. But it is something that at national level, the UK has been engaged in for many years. And, and I've been fortunate enough to be part of that discussion. All of this is, is familiar, I'm sure, to all of you. And if, if Joe Chapa is in the in the audience today, um, Joe and I have spoken about these issues in the past when, when, when we've met and discussed, and I know he'll be wrestling with them for the United States Air Force. As we move from automation to autonomy, and, and the key element in that move is, is AI, intelligent systems, what can, what can be done with reduced human input? Now, automation we've had for a very long time and, and has worked very well. For me, the big difference is, does the machine, does the system have a, to some extent, a, a self-learning capability? And I will leave, I wish I could see the, the philosophical panels and I'll leave that to, I'll, I'll leave the discussion to them about self-awareness and self-enhancing around AI. But I want to focus on a more limited technical application and understanding um, in in my work and perhaps in, in what I'm sharing today. At the university, I work with uh, Professor Adrian Hopgood, who has been a professor of artificial intelligence for 25 years. And for me to, to be able to wrestle with the ethical aspects of AI, and I think those of us who are primarily ethicists, um, we need technical expertise. I have an engineering degree by background, but that's not the same as as cutting edge understanding of what AI and intelligence systems can achieve. And therefore, what are the ethical issues that arise from it? And you can see I've, I've put a list there of just some of the, the condition, uh, some of the considerations around decision making, um, recommendations, how much will you trust a, a system, a machine system um, that gives you recommendations? I guess that depends on the severity. If it's if it's a recommendation for staff promotion, that's one thing. If it's recommendation 
uh, target A versus target B with different levels of collateral damage, that, that's a completely different level of trust. Um, in terms of processing and analysis, the, the and different types of analysis, again, what does the technology enable us to do? Because there is so much myth around what it can do. And, and human equivalents, AI human equivalents, has since the 1960s been about 20 years in the future. And, and it's still talked of as 20 or more years in the future. So um, we have a great advantage with AI, though, in, in managing data and I will go on in a moment to talk a bit about, about Reaper, remotely piloted aircraft systems part because I've been, my research has been embedded in that for so many years. And partly because the US Predator program and Reaper program, like the UK, much smaller Reaper program, these alone, never mind the, 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 the maritime and land equivalents, they generate vast amounts of data. And that's where we, we, may be able to find some of the most effective applications of, of AI. What can we teach it? How can we educate the systems? How many photos of, of bits of military hardware from different angles do you need to feed into a system uh, in order for it to start recognizing its own and then perhaps learning to look for something that it hasn't been exactly described yet? So um, in terms of data, data management, and where is the accuracy in this? What is the, um, in terms of ethics, how much knowledge is enough for, for a system to, to be let loose in a defense domain? Do we want 100% effectiveness? That's not going to happen. Humans don't do that. Um, and tied into all of these are, are legal I've mentioned ethical, but also moral in terms of how to touch on humans and practical perspectives as well. So in terms of in terms of AI, as I'm as I as we're discussing it in the UK uh, very widely, many approaches, of course, but this is one that I, I find particularly useful from from my colleague. And in terms of these intelligent systems, knowledge-based systems. So what are the rules? Case-based reasoning, model-based. And on the other side, perhaps a bit more, a bit more popularized now, neural networks, deep learning, genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms. If you take evolutionary algorithms, which can produce different range of outcomes, but some of them will, will be quite poor and some of them will be very good. In a defense context, do you really want to, to spend too much time working with poor algorithms? Um, do you want to, to narrow down the evolutionary options of the algorithms more quickly? I, I like the Microsoft example from about four or five years ago now, where Microsoft put a, a self-learning bot, just a chat bot, on the internet to see what it could learn and would learn about the, the internet. And in 24 hours, this self-learning chat bot learned to be racist, um, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, misogynistic. It, it learned every hate-based um, system of thought that human beings are capable of thinking. And it was withdrawn. And, and I think Microsoft was ridiculed, but I think they did a great service to, to showing what happens with unrestrained self-learning um, in, in a fairly harmless uh, environment. What was less popular or less well-known because it was not so controversial was a year later they did the same thing but in the subsequent chatbot they put in a number of constraining rules so it could not use certain words and language and vocabulary so it, it immediately did not cause the same degree of offense and so in terms of in terms of artificial intelligence or intelligent systems there is no one system that's going to do anything rather even in a single weapon system, it could well draw on multiple types of, of intelligence systems, um, be they deep learning on one hand, rules based on the other hand, and in the middle, these, this kind of fuzzy logic that, that um, combines the two in different creative ways. And again, the ethics, the, the, the ethical challenges of that are significant because how do you have a rules-based ethic if you don't know exactly what rules the, the, the algorithm is using. And so then a consequentialist or outcome ethic uh, can be very useful. 
And in reality, it, it will need to be something of, of the two. And mixed into that, there will be the human element as well. Um, I, I see I have about uh, two minutes left. And so the humans are limiting factors, not only operationally, but in terms of, in terms of speed of thought, in terms of empathy, psychology. And by the way, I really want to, to always mention that even in an autonomous system or an AI enabled system, there will be humans in it or nearby it or touching it and humans seeing terrible things and there will still be human harms as well as human outputs to the operator. Um, questions of accountability and responsibility. It's again, where is the where is the ethical responsibility? I'm going just to, to skip to um, sorry, I'm, I'm speeding through my slides because I want to finish just with this distribution of ethical responsibility because it doesn't disappear in an AI enabled system of any degree of autonomy. I, I like to refer to, to systems with, with varying degrees of autonomy. There is still going to be ethical responsibility for human beings. It, it never ceases to s surprise me how astounded many civilian friends and colleagues are at exactly how many human beings would still be involved in, in an autonomous system, take an aircraft uh, system, because you still need someone to put fuel in, hang bombs off it, check the engines, check the avionics, check the programming, check the weather it's going to fly in. It will still be at the disposal of political leaders and senior commanders. It will be at the disposal and function of policymakers and weapons manufacturers will have, will have their degree of responsibility as well. So in terms of, of the, the overall approach, I don't think I've said anything that will be any different to, to what's found in the US. Um, but I would like to just, just finish on that point about ethical responsibilities. They don't disappear. They, 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 if anything, go wider in a constellation that more people will recognize they are part of a kill chain uh, with responsibility. And that is uh, that's going to be very sobering and challenging. Thank you very much. And now, because the uh, e UK and EU perspectives are different officially, Dr. Reichberg, okay. for the EU. Should I sit here or the podium? I mean, I'm fine. Yeah, Either the way. podium, that's fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, first I'd like to say what a great pleasure it is to be here. Uh, in 2019, uh, a few of us sat down to write a grant application, and I have to say that I work at a research institute. Uh, we don't have teaching duties, and people sometimes say to me, wow, that must be fantastic. You can just, you know, time to, to think and write and read. And I said, well, there is a catch. Right? We have to write and submit grant applications. Um, so, you know, I, and I'll also say, you know, you, you have to pick your poison. You can write grant applications or you can grade exams. Uh, and now after having written grant applications for 20 years, grading the exams is starting to look pretty good. But anyway, we uh, sat down to write the application and I have to say we did this with uh, George Lucas and the two cooks, uh, right? Uh, Martin and Jim. And in this case, the too many cooks did not spoil the, the broth. All right, so, and uh, we thought that it would lift, lift up the application if we could do an event in conjunction with the Stockdale Center. So we approached Ed, and we proposed that we do an event on uh, AI military applications and the ethics thereof. And I was really happy that Ed took us up on the proposal, and so too did Joe Thomas. So, so here we are now. Uh, and I have to say we were triply lucky, really. First of all, we got the grant funded. Secondly, the conference is taking place, you know, despite COVID. And third, Ed did nearly all of the work. So thanks so much, Ed. Um, so, okay. Uh, no good deed goes without punishment. So towards the end of the process, we, Henrik and I said to Ed, uh, 
is there anything we could do to contribute? And Ed said, well, you know, there are two slots that, that could be covered. Uh, one was uh, virtue ethics and its relevance to AI, and the other was European perspectives. So I decided to leave the heavy uh, philosophical lifting to Henrik where it's better placed, okay? And I, I chose uh, the European developments in AI military applications, about which, of course, I knew very little. So what I did was try to put together some, some of the, you know, the main lines of, of what's happening in Europe. So, uh, oops, got to go back. Oh, I'm going to try to get this to work. Yeah, okay, so I had a look at a uh, website, uh, EU website, uh, and before even launching into this, I should say in the interest of full disclosure that I just recently uh, put in an application along with colleagues at PRIO for a three million euro grant, uh, and it's, it, we put it into the uh, EU commission, so I've taken an oath not to say anything critical about the EU until I find out whether that grant is funded. So that, will, that won't be until October. So, okay. But basically, you know, when it comes to the landscape, uh, I, there, there's a, a page on the uh, European Commission's Joint Research Center, something called the AI Watch Index. And, uh, and here are a few of the comments that they make on, on that page. Okay, they acknowledge that the field of artificial intelligence continues to be dominated by the U.S. and China, but they think that they have a comparative advantage in a few sectors. Okay, AI services and robotics, and I can say there is a tremendous amount going on in, in the area of robotics. I see that even in Norway. Uh, you know, they put down a, uh, developing ethics guidelines with a global perspective and ensuring an innovation-friendly legal framework. Uh, Frontier research, right, holding the second position in a number of AI publications behind the U.S. Finally, they mentioned net, network of collaborations focused on AI research, and that's actually what we put uh, our application in for. So, who are the relevant actors? Well, we've got the EU Commission and Parliament, so the Commission is more the executive branch of EU governance, and then Parliament is the legislative branch. You've got the European Defense Agency. We've got NATO. And then we have individual states. And finally, there's the, you know, what I call the policy ecosystem. Okay, a few words about the EU Commission and the EU Parliament. Uh, the goal their stated goal is to become the world's leader in tech regulation, all right? And that's already happening, all right? Uh, so, and there are a number of documents that have been uh, published in, in this domain. Uh, so, for instance, there's a, you know, Artificial Intelligence for Europe, 2018. It's an EU strategy document. Then there's the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation, which is all about protecting individuals from protecting their data their personal integrity. And the, you know, the GDPR has really wide-ranging implications in, in Europe and even worldwide. And the goal is to be a standard setter in this domain. Uh, now, just recently, was announced the, the um, Digital Markets Act. And the goal of that act is to rein in monopolistic global network platforms. And, uh, I happen to mention uh, to a European colleague, a computer scientist, who's uh, one of the leading people in, in the field of AI ethics, I mentioned the, the recent publication by um, Eric Schmidt and Henry Kissinger, uh, an age of the, the new age of AI, something like that. And I found out that that book is just being slaughtered in the European biosphere. Okay, well, the name Henry Kissinger doesn't help. Yeah. All right, that's part of it. But the other thing is the book makes a lot out of what they call these, these large uh, network-centric global platforms. And Europe does not like these platforms. They view this as a monopolistic trend. Uh, they, they view it as, as a way to kind of sort of lose sight of the individual in the interests of really in large financial interests and so forth. 
so th this, this digital market acts is, is an attempt to move away from that. Uh, now there's what they call the uh, EU AI Act, which is meant to be a, a large-scale large -scale legislation on AI consumer applications. The stuff that's of interest to us, you know, primarily here today, uh, the, the military side is, is left out of the uh, EU AI Act. Uh, then there's a, you know, a white paper about which there's been a lot of talk, which is called On AI, A European Approach to Gender and Trust, and it's all about trustworthy AI. Okay, now that there's a European Parliament, there are several European parliamentary resolutions. I'm going to mention just one. Uh, it's called Resolution of 20 October 2020, and the title is um, uh, uh, Recommendations to the Commission on a Framework of Ethical Aspects of AI, Robotics, and Related Industries. All right, and they, have, they come with a number of uh, recommendations. I'll, I'll just mention one which I think is signi particularly significant. They want a harmonious approach to ethical principles relating to AI and robotics. And the idea is to reach some sort of common understanding across the European Union. Whoops, what happened there again? Oh, there we go. So um, also in this, this document, this, this, and I think it's kind of unique among the EU documents that I've seen, there is a section on defense and security. Uh, and it's just a page, a little bit o over a page. And it, it makes for an interesting read because, you know, there are two prongs of just war theory. There's the, what you can call the, uh, the, the restrictions, the, limit, the limitations prong, uh, things you should not do in a war context. But there's also what you can call the enabling prong. You know, what are the occasions when we, we can resort to armed force and should? And what are the sort of things we can do and sometimes should do in the context of, you know, uh, conflict. Sometimes it can be a big mistake not to bring to, not to bring to bear enough force uh, for you know a, a particular situation. So anyway, this one page kind of works through these two sides of the coin: the limitations, the restrictions. But they also have interesting comments, and I'll just read you uh, two uh, on more the enabling side. Um, they. Uh, they, they say, in, in the hybrid and advanced warfare context of today, uh, uh, human decision makers are tracking the full spectrum of information within an, need to track the full spectrum of information within an appropriate time frame for a speedy response, and AI can enable that. Uh, and another one I, I really like, underlines the importance of investing in the development of, of human capital for artificial intelligence fostering the necessary skills and education in the field of security and defense AI technologies, with a particular focus on ethics of semi-autonomous semi and autonomous operational systems. And they stress in particular the importance of ensuring that ethicists in the field have appropriate skills and receive proper training. Yeah. So, okay, I've got the, oh, oops. So really fast now, we've got the European Defense Agency, um, which is m mainly intended to be something like the JAKE, the Joint AI Center. It's all about fostering AI innovation within the defense sector. Uh, they haven't put out any documents that I can see specifically on ethics. It sounds like a very big organization, but it only has about 140 employees. Um, then we've got NATO, of course. Here there's a lot that, that, that could be said. Um, you know, they've adopted an AI strategy. What, what they're really focusing in on at NATO is interoperability throughout the alliance. And they think about interoperability both in terms of technical interoperability, same sort of shared technical standards, but they, they're also talking, this is my term, but anyway, to try to render ethical interoperability, to make sure that the members of the alliance are all on the same page, you know, on, on, you know, the key ethical principles. Okay, then there's, there's quite a bit you can say in the individual European states. I'll, I'll just note that only France has published a standalone AI military strategy document. Uh, the Netherlands and Hungary, interestingly, are, uh, have announced documents in progress. Um, 
several countries have published, you know, military strategy documents with sections on AI. Note the motivations for publishing these strategy documents. I mean, they're, they're, they're popping up like mushrooms all over the place. You've got to shape international norms for the use of military AI, to bring national attention to military AI, AI to encourage public and private sector innovation, and to encourage regional collaboration. Okay, then, just to conclude, you know, there is a policy ecosystem uh, quite vibrant in Europe. Uh, and I, I mentioned the leaders. I, I, I think this, you know, CIPRI, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, really is at the forefront. They've, they've published a number of really groundbreaking reports. Uh, but you've got other, other places, the, the Osser Institute in The Hague. You've got the NATO Co-op Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn. Uh, you've got Chatham House London, and then you've got the Peace Research Institute Oslo. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for uh, complying with the time restrictions. And obviously this is set up just as an introduction, and, and so you can contact the speakers, obviously, to get more information. But just wanted to give a little taste of what's going on elsewhere. So, sir, yeah, thanks, all Ed. yours. Thanks, you know, Ed. As my slides are coming up. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Ed. I really appreciate the, the opportunity to speak. Thank you to uh, uh, the Stockdale Center. Uh, this is a great, this is really a great forum. Uh, I do have to say, when I first walked through Gate 3 50 years ago this July, I never expected to come to a conference like this, but five decades have passed like that, so it's, it's wonderful. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is presenting a, a summary of the, a paper that I wrote for this conference, and uh, if you would like a copy of the draft, just contact me and I'll be happy to send it to you. And what I'm going to be focusing on today is um, the... Uh, the CCP's role in uh, the Chinese Communist Party's role in military ethics. And that's why I put this uh, picture of the sailor on, uh, on liberty in Hong Kong. He's walking in front of this, this great slogan that you'll always see uh, in, uh, in, in, in military bases, on ships, wherever. Follow the party, fight to win, forge exemplary conduct. It's all about the party. The, parties, the, the party is the organization that sets the rules, the rules and regulations. Oh. Perfect. Thanks. So, like, uh, so the military reports to the party, I think, as most people know, in, in the, in the uh, PRC. And as such, military ethics are under political control. They're considered a political uh, topic. So run-of-the-mill soldiers and sailors don't get to write about military ethics. The authoritative stuff comes out of political colleges. And uh, one of the more recent ones, one of the more recent documents, uh, was this uh, investigation of modern Chinese military ethics culture building. Nice, you know, rolls off your tongue, I know. But it, um, it, it was good because it was the first time, at least I had found, and a couple of my colleagues who study this have found, somebody sitting down and saying, what are we trying to do with military ethics? You, you can kind of infer it in some of the journal articles. But they, they listed these types of things, and uh, I'll just highlight a couple of them. You know, obviously to improve troop morale, uh, to justify strategic decisions. This was one that kind of surprised me. They said when, when uh, CV-16, the uh, uh, Liaoning, was first deployed, uh, the PRC got a lot of pushback from the international community. Why does, it, why does the PRC need an, an aircraft carrier? And they said they went back and they looked at the ethical considerations, and because of the ethics, they said they made the decision to deploy the Liaoning. Uh, to fac facilitate weapon systems development, uh, their unique considerations. And then finally, a more Chinese approach to destroy an adversary's morale by weaponizing morality. And, I'm, and, and I, was, I had to do a double take when I read that article because it said, this is an ethical consideration, and then it went and talked about how you went about doing that. So it's, uh, it, it, the, the point I'm trying to make is it's different. The, approach, the Chinese approach, the PRC's approach to military ethics is different. The sources, um, according to this book and according to some other uh, journal articles, the primary sources, unsurprisingly, are Marxist, uh, Marxist ethics. And then following closely on that is with the CCP leadership, Chinese Communist Party leadership, whether it's Mao Zedong or these days Xi Jinping, have to say their guidance is, is supreme. Uh, there's a little bit of traditional philosophy more along the lines of this is Chinese culture, so you know we're going to do some things that the Confucius or Lao Tzu might have said. But 
you don't see explicit references to Confucius and Lao Tzu in any, any writings about Chinese military ethics. And then finally, uh, the PRC uh, looks at, the PLA looks at foreign military ethics. They study those very carefully. They want to see what the world is doing. However, they have the caveat and they say, but if we decide to do anything, we need to carefully vet it to make sure it doesn't bring in any bad ideas to, to harm our sailors and our soldiers. So they're very aware of this, and this is a theme that the Chinese military really studies the West. The needs, why do they need military ethics according to the, the, this book? Uh, they need it because they have a lot of social issues. The West is causing huge problems for the incoming uh, officers and enlisted personnel in the Chinese military. They have all these bad ideas. They, they're, they're thinking about individuality. Money's number one. They all like to, as this picture at the bottom right shows, uh, this, there's a Chinese expression, di uh, toren, uh, which basically means people with their head bowed, which is how they describe people walking around looking into their cell phones all the time. Uh, there, there's concern about that. Uh, they also want to use military ethics to support the China dream, and specifically the, the military portion of that, a strong military, the dream of a strong military, which Xi Jinping is really pushing. And then finally, they want to deal with the unique considerations of science and technology development. They realize that, that the people who are developing these weapon systems and, and these new capabilities, they, they have, there are a lot of challenges they face. They want to make sure that they're thinking things through the correct way, i.e. the way the party wants them to think. So they, that's also part of military ethics. Sources. Yep. Uh, so let me switch over to military AI ethics now. That was just kind of a background on what, how the Chinese military ethics differ from the West. Um, I found three basic areas of, uh, of sources. The first is what you would see in, in government documents. I refer to it as diplo speak because it says a lot without saying anything. And uh, this, this one document that they released to the uh, UN convention on, uh, on uh, certain uh, conventional weapons in December has a chapter on, excuse me, has a paragraph on uh, AI ethics and it's, it's motherhood. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's part of what the government says. Uh, the second thing is the, uh, the PLA Daily Newspaper, which was a very interesting source because it really provided a forum for, for people to talk about um, artificial intelligence and considerations and concerns about artificial intelligence. Granted, it's approved by the Chinese Communist Party, so you know there's a bit, a bit of, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of authoritative, but they still discuss, uh, it, to an extent, they discuss topics. And one of the articles, for example, is this article up here calling, called Pay attention to the ethical black hole of intelligentized warfare. Uh, you can tell which direction that's leading. Uh, it's, it's talking about the dangers of, of AI. And the, the intelligentized warfare is another, uh, another term that is used uh, for AI. Uh, but they don't discuss specific policy decisions. That's one of the things you find out for, for a number of reasons. Uh, PLA-affiliated PLA authors in journals, uh, that's one of the nice things about journals is they identify the unit affiliation and so on and so forth with authors. Uh, there's extensive writing about what, what's going on everywhere else in the world except in China. They really don't want to get into the details of what the PLA is doing. Uh, and this is, this is normal. They, they, uh, you know, it's, they, they, they have a lot of ambiguity. Uh, they, uh, they really uh, they, they avoid dealing with specifics. And that's in large part due to the concern about state secrets. They don't want to be accused of releasing information that Today may not be a state secret, but tomorrow may be a state secret. You never know. So there's that kind of ambiguity. However, every once in a while, you do find an article, which I smiled when I found it, said this article was funded by this fund, which is the Research and Ethical Issues of Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems. So I said, this is probably an article worth reading. Uh, and then finally, I would argue that uh, there are a lot more PLA discussions that are going on, but they just aren't public for the reasons that I've described. So what are, the, what are the themes? One of the big themes is the U.S. experience in dealing with remote systems has yielded a lot of useful information about the dangers, about the, the challenges, uh, about uh, you know, the, the moral, moral injury, uh, you know, all these types of things that we, we've dealt with over the decades. Uh, and then another theme they come up with is autonomous systems will be much more challenging than this if we decide to go with autonomous systems. Uh, Assignment of responsibility, assignment of accountability, those are big issues that they're concerned about. Um, making ethical decisions in response to unanticipated activity is another concern that comes up. 
uh, inadvertent enabling of terrorism, which is a topic I never expected to see, but they said if these systems start coming out and they become available, it's going to enable things for terrorists, and we need to watch out about that. And then finally, the development of, uh, of subjective consciousness. I guess that's Elon Musk's, uh, his hot, one of his hobby horses. But the bottom line is there's another article, which I unfortunately put in a very small print at the bottom. Uh, it was entitled, In Future Wars Will Unmanned Take a Leading Role? And this was actually a point and counterpoint article in People's Daily. And the, and the conclusion was, well, the battlefield confrontation may be unmanned. Combat control must be manned. And so my observations and conclusion are the Chinese Communist Party wants the PLA to implement military AI. It wants the their military to have the best. Xi Jinping has said he wants their military to have the best, and that, that includes AI. But the PLA is aware of military AI, ethic, AI ethical challenges, and they're wrestling to deal with them. It's interesting in the way that the, the topic is addressed in journal articles and even in people's da or in, in PLA Daily. Uh, it's very that the, the discussion is surprisingly pragmatic and surprisingly apolitical. I, I, Pleasantly, I haven't read anything about Marxism in any of the discussion of AI ethics. And so it means, I think it means that they're really looking at this seriously. And the big question, as I would state it, is how does the CCP slash PLA uh, uh, predictably control an AI system that is, by its very nature, autonomous? That's what they're trying to wrestle with. The party wants to control the military. They also want these great capabilities. You know, they're trying to, trying to split the difference between the two. So I would argue in the near term, the PLA is going to likely use their AI capabilities to enhance military applications. But it's going to be a while until they figure out how to deal with this and how to, how to fully come, how to deal with uh, develop and deploy fully autonomous systems. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks to all the speakers for uh, being on time. And um, of course, we're late for lunch. So we can take questions for about, uh, let's see, just five minutes or so, <clears throat> if anyone has any. OK, and, um, and when, you, when you ask a question, please state for whom the question is, because uh, just to make sure that the, um, the, the virtual speakers can kind of cue in on it. Yes, thank you for those presentations. Uh, my question is for uh, Mark Metcalf. How do you weaponize morality, and can you give some, ex perhaps, I don't know, relatively modern examples f uh, f from China? It was a great article from uh, uh, about 10 years ago. And, and the, the way you weaponize morality is, is you can do it both offensively and you can do it defensively. What you're doing is you're highlighting the moral shortcomings of your adversary. And you do that during peacetime to degrade their capabilities, to ruin the, the morale of the country, and to basically to say, you know, your country isn't worth it. And in, in, in wartime, what you do is you use morality to defend what your country's actions are. Uh, I've, I've got a paper on it if you're interested. It's, it's, it, it was just a fascinating article to read. And again, when I, when I first read it and saw that it was covered under ethics, I went, wow, this is definitely a different perspective on ethics. <laughs> Any more questions? Everyone's hungry? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank especially uh, Peter and Anna for uh, coming in virtually, and um, I have their contact information. Oh, what's that? Peter had a question? Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. It, it was a comment, actually, after Mark's comment, if I may. Oh, yeah. Um, I, uh, about three years ago, did a project with, with three colleagues, which could be described, the title could be described as Moralities in Conflict in Syria. And I looked at a Western just war perspective. One colleague looked at a Russian perspective, another conventional Islam, and another one, jihad. And one conclusion that we found was that every purveyor of every moral system felt that theirs was superior to the others. Um, not that there was equivalence, but they were, theirs was superior. But in different ways, um, Russia and conventional Islamic states like Saudi Arabia were much more willing to incorporate, explicitly incorporate morality and religion 
into their political and military ends in a way that wasn't so common in the West, where there's this degree of separation of church and state. Sometimes there's a, there's a parallel separation of, of um, not giving public moral guidance to, to political and military leaders. Uh, when our Archbishop of Canterbury decided to, to lecture our Prime Minister on, on immigration policy on Easter Sunday last week, it did not go down well. So, <laughs> so how morality is used and framed is, is significant, but very different in different uh, protagonist states. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Anyone else? Okay, well, thanks uh, to everyone on the panel, uh, and especially uh, Anand Peter. And if anyone in the audience uh, would like to, to ask them some questions in the future, just get in touch with me, and I have their contact information. So thanks to all of our panelists. and. Um